And welcome, everybody, to the Bandit Radio Hour. Uh, you know what we're doing tonight, folks? I ain't got no bullet points. I ain't got nothing. We are winging this. We are having a good time in Central Florida, and we are rocking it on Mercer Rain. We finally got rain. We did finally get rain. It was nice. Like, it's been, every time I've mowed, it's been less chopping grass and more just spreading dust around everywhere and making the ugliest, blackest boogers you've ever seen in your damn life. Which I just wanted to ask, uh, what have you been up to this past week? Uh, hang on. Uh, side, side note, my producer, this episode's getting out a little bit later than normal. I have to tell you about how much my producer let down the show, but it's because he is such a good friend. <laughs> this dude, I end up, uh, what, what day did you start feeling bad? Monday, and it's Tuesday. all his fault, none of mine. I make perfect scheduling decisions that don't interfere with anybody else's life. He just gets things wrong, and that's okay. That's it. We accept those things, and we move on. Uh, but anyways, what day did you start feeling sick? By Tuesday, I was very sick. Yeah. And, and then by Thursday, I was deathbed, dying. And in the meantime... He is helping one of our friends that has a, what would you call land his company? Land clearing business. And Merce, do you work for him because you need the money? No, he needs employees. And we're in Florida. We're in the big open place. And he needs employees. And Merce just does that because Merce just, I, I, I work if I need the money. I'm, I'm lazy. But literally, I'm calling this SOB at like a, Trying to get us rounded up to record, and he's like, listen, I have a 102 degree fever, I have snot coming out of my nose, and I'm operating a skid steer that I fell into a hole last week with. <gasps> we'll record later. <laughs> <laughs> so we're finally here a couple of days late, and we hope y'all don't mind. But well, what the hell, what, where were y'all working at? Placida. What were y'all doing? Uh, cleaning out a trailer park that got hit by tornadoes. I've literally seen what happens when a tornado hits a trailer park. It's not good. What happens? It goes everywhere. How how many trailers? Like, all right, how we, bad? We took out four trailers by by trailer load. Yeah, like, wait, hey, that was before the tornado got there. You just, you just took out four trailers. What was no no no? no the I'm tornado had already hit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you were drunk and implicit and having a good time. <laughs> I was sick, or we would have. Uh, yes, true, <laughs> true. All right, so no, so what? Like, how big is this trailer park? Uh, it's probably like 150, 200 units. Okay. It's if anybody listening it is the Gas Gasparilla Estates. It's just a little trailer park right at the Gasparilla Marina, just where you go to like in the bridge, like in the mm-hmm. Grand. Mm-hmm. I'm a sixth generation Floridian, and I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never been there either. Yeah, I I stay in my town, um, but uh. So, all right, and, and so you, you say y'all had to remove how many trailers? Four. Four. How bad, like, what's left of them? Oh, there's no roof, they're mangled, and it basically involved, like, ripping them out with excavators and skid steers, but then the long process was them being on your hands and knees picking up all the insulation mm. and pieces of mm. debris, right. and I'm doing that in 95-degree heat, running 102-degree fever, and... Vomiting. Yeah. And by the way, like I talked to my uh, my son's mom up in Michigan like two days ago, and it's like forty degrees up there. So yeah, people down here in Florida, it's it, for people in the rest of the world, it's hot right now. It is. It's May what second? Yeah, and it's kicked up in the nineties. Uh, and in hindsight, you might have been right. I shouldn't have been there because I was like, oh, I'm deathly dehydrated <laughs> because I can't keep anything down because I'm vomiting. So there's like no water in my system. And Brad at one point was like. You're really white. <laughs> <laughs> and this man's already really white. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, so, so like, when did this tornado thing happen? It actually happened back in January. Oh, so they, snowbird season. So yeah. there was people in them. Yeah. Oh, no, there were people in them. We Ooh. met some of the neighbors. But the uh, then the problem was they couldn't get any funding or help. And then I guess a few weeks later, DeSantis actually got word of it. FEMA or nobody from the actual federal government would help them mm-hmm. and DeSantis declared it his own federal or state emergency right so they could get funding and they just gotten the funding cleared in now for us to go help start pulling out trailers so, mm-hmm. so basically DeSantis is a socialist I, I got you something yeah um, oh, I know. he wrote a check <laughs> and I was there vomiting pulling up trailers so a kid I kid I mean kind of not really but yeah mostly kid uh but uh no nah, good for them good those people got that cleaned up and all that anybody die any bodies? I mean, no, I know they luckily, weren't. Luckily, no injuries. They're surprisingly like 
but it was bad, like to completely destroy the route. They had to dig some people out, but no. Oh, really? Yeah, but no, it, it happened like in the middle of the night. It was a what it was was a, a funnel, uh, a funnel cloud or a water spout <laughs> that came on land. Hey on, hey on, hey on, and this is down a little Gasparilla. Yeah. Which which is like if now tell me if I'm wrong because like I said I've been down there like twice in my life and it's like what an hour and a half away from here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's like a very high cost of living area. Yes. Yeah, extremely. But there's this trailer park. <gasps> the yeah. one trailer park. The one trailer park next to the sea. Next to the expensive marina, the condominiums, everything. <laughs> the one snowbird trailer park and a water. Well, there's a few locals. Apparently, I found, I found out I had a, on my dad's side a great uncle that had a trailer there. <laughs> the, the, my God, your royalty in them <laughs> parts. I don't know if it was the right one. I was like, my fingers like my luck. I was like, oh, I'm probably cleaning out my uncle's trailer. <laughs> dude, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, that's dude. Them things are like magnets. For oh. what if, dude? What? And this was just like an F1. I don't imagine how bad it is out west when like an F4 or something hits them. I know hurricanes, not tornadoes. Higher number, more dangerous. Do they have names? No. <laughs> queers um <laughs> but, uh, whoopsie not like gay queers like yeah, queers <laughs> like smear the queer when you put a lot of people aren't gonna know what that is that was a football game we played growing up that uh if i get too into detail on that i'm, I'm probably already canceled oh well uh but what if this is what i was getting at what if we discover so like all right you know how like we look back at like roman pipes and we're like oh they all had like lead piping and that was slowly killing them or whatever what if there's some like manufacturing thing in mobile homes that when you have them all together is like a magnetic attraction for tornadoes what if they discover that in a thousand years I don't know, but it is uh, uncanny. And it, like, and it won't be like a mag, like quote unquote magnetic connection, right. but something that like they'll be like, oh, this insulation that they used in all these modular homes, like is just pulls the air toward. I don't know something. We we were worried that like there might be like a bunch of asbestos in these old mm-hmm. like sixties trailers. Breathe it in, boys. But we googled it. It's mainly found in the roofs. So like, oh, it's fine. The roofs aren't even here anymore. Well, yeah, <laughs> they're long gone. They're the they're the neighborhood's problem. <laughs> Oh, right there on the playground. And the irony is there's one cattle farmer. He's like got one little, he's like got well, one There's There's little, one holdout. And one cattle farmer and all the debris landed in his property. He's the only person that had per- private property that the, everyone wasn't cleaning up. Yeah. So yeah, that was, and what, and over the weekend, you just stayed in bed and hibernated, right? Essentially. Yeah. yeah and took care of a bull that got out. And oh, some, the neighbors and yeah. Yeah. It happens. I, uh, you know what? I had a wonderful weekend. I did nothing. <laughs> oh, no, well, well, hang on. I did clean up the pastures, Yeah, which I'm going to try. All right, so we got like 10 acres I'm going to try to mow on one of those little eagle lawn mowers. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do it, i got to clean it all up. So me and Lily combed the pasture, uh, me and my daughter, and uh, got that done. Me and her played with her calf. And I taught her the wonders of Mortal Kombat, which was pretty awesome. And please tell me you destroyed her. Right no, now. she's she's a smart cookie. She knew better than the player daddy. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> I show her up at Mario Party. She don't want none, son. She knows better. Uh, but welcome to the show. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. I'm like I'm the world. I'm not taking it easy on you. Not in this. The one thing I'm really good at. <laughs> I will shine in this. Thunderdome. <laughs> but she really, uh, yeah, it, it, and it was cool. And like, I don't know, I'm pretty, I'd say, even though I have fist fought my producer and most of, w- w- would you say I'm one of the more reluctant people to engage in violence? Yeah. For the most part? It's not your go-to. Come compared to most Arca- Arcadians, at least. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but like one of my first memories ever, that like core memories is living in my ACA. And I'm probably three years old, and I'm trying to copy my brother to be Sub Zero to do the uppercut fatality where you would take someone's head off with their spine connected. And like I'm thinking about that, I'm like, I'm gonna get to do. It. I'm not that. Like this is what I'm I might get at with that point is I'm one of the. I'm not gonna say least violent. Cause I'm like I know preachers. I'm sure they're less 
prone to violence than I am. But like out of hooligans and Arcadia, yeah, I'm pretty low on the list. Uh, but I was like, this is going to be like a cool thing to like do with my daughter. Like, you know, play. and the, the one thing, and she's like, cool. She, she's really like, doesn't harm a fly. Uh, don't, don't have to worry about anything with her. Something I didn't account for is how new the graphics make everything look so real and the different thing. They've gone from uppercutting a dude's head off and like little cartoonishly spouts of blood come out to like, oh, that guy's using his arm swords to chop someone into five different pieces while they're still alive and then start eating them. And Lily's like, do it again, daddy. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. <laughs> ah, too late. Her mom signed off on it. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but so, so let me think. We did that. We cleaned up uh, sticks in a pasture so I could mow. Uh, had horse got horses dumped on us that that are ours but had to take care of them house them while we're already at like pretty much max capacity for the weekend and got them out of here yesterday uh and on monday i worked cows and man i haven't done that in a while uh and i'm getting much more so like i've always been excellent at running them up the chute and for what you don't know what that is or what, or what working cows is, it's when you get all the cows you have together in their calves, you, you give them medicine, you mark them, uh, you do, it's pretty much bring them to the pen, do everything you need to do three times a year. Uh, and we were doing that. And so we did that yesterday with 187 cows and, and their calves. Uh, and that was fun. Uh, that actually was, I actually learned a lot more. Uh, did did a little bit more than just running them up the chute. Uh, but what I was getting to is today I had a very exceptional job of cleaning out a trailer that an old Jamaican lived in for 12 years. No, no, no. He lived in it for longer than that. He lived in it for like probably 15, 20 years. And it's had nobody living in it for about 10 years. And it's had parts of it open to the outside. So it was just, and I mean, it's like out in the woods and we're, it's going to be our new, uh, tack room and per, permanent or no, 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 not permanent tack room, temporary tack room. And to anybody, like if anyone's like me and listens to this stuff, whenever you're working or whenever you're doing stuff, if you are sweeping so many rat and possum turds that you're seeing dust fly in the air, I feel your pain. <laughs> or at least I did earlier today. That was, yeah, but Owned all that, we're caught up with everything. We need to jump into some current events. And Merce, what the hell's going on with food processing plants across the United States? Convenience. Well, yeah, that's the word of the day. Uh, so, all right, here, here's the thing. Merce sent me an article earlier from uh, the Wall Street Post, maybe. Uh, maybe we will get that in at least the show notes, unless he's able to pull it up. Really quick. Sorry for the burp. But, uh, Western Journal. Western Journal. All right. And, like, I will say, I, when I was reading that, there was a part of me when I was reading, like, the link you sent me that was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This might be embellishing certain truth a little hard in one direction. How do we know there's not fires there all like, you know, this isn't a yearly thing that happens normally that they're blowing out of proportion. So I actually do the good old blue check mark Google box search. Just hey, food processing plants fire. Uh and the first article that points out that jumps up of of course, on Google, it's like, why, con- uh, how conservatives are wrong for, or not conservatives are wrong, how the far right is wrong for freaking out about, or, uh, about these fires, or no, no one is in fact setting them. And I read this article that talks about how there's like thousands of fires every year, and how it's all, uh, all, what do you call it? How it's all like regular, they're even like, you know, food is technically a type of fuel, so it's not that crazy that these fuel processing plants... Well, grain bins are extremely dangerous. That, the grain fired, like the grain the grain dust is highly flammable. Yes. But, but they are usually freak accidents. Yeah. However, and I'll... If I look up the source, I'll, I'll, I'll if I go back to the source, I'll bring it up a little bit later, because so, I like trying to keep those in there. Uh, 
like in this long description, uh, in this long article, in the middle of it, they're like, and here is an example of like the right taking this situation and blowing it out of proportion. And like it has a little like, not even a YouTube link, but just like a video embed in the article. And like it's in the middle of the article. So I'm like, all right, I'll click play and see. see. And it's like a Tucker Carlson thing. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, he's normally their, their batting boy for far right. What's How are they claiming that? Let's see. Ha, let's see them show Tucker exaggerating this. Tucker Carlson goes on to talk about in this video they have on their website about two different planes crashing into two different food processing plant centers, and I'm like, that has nothing to do with with the just shit going wrong at these places. These are planes crashing into them, and it's like I'm like, how often does that happen, Pilot Merce? We try not to hit them. No, they, ain't that like what makes y'all some of y'all's money? <laughs> yeah. And it's it's small private planes, and it's and uh, now for now on, when I hear news stories involving small private planes, that sets off certain radars, certain red flags, because it's interesting if you trace the ownership of private planes in some of these big situations to who actually owns them, or if they're owned by a company, what that company actually does. It is incredible how many times it points to the usual suspects of these things that the tinfoil hats want to want to claim. And it usually I'm, starts with a C, ends with an A. Yeah, yeah, with a nice big I in the middle. Uh, it's it's or some intelligence agency. Uh, by the way, hey, update on one of my last things. So you know how I was talking about uh, uh, Henry Kissinger with John Stockwell, right? Uh, and how, like, that was the thing that really red pilled him was seeing him at a, uh, uh, meeting when he was acting like a little child, you know, our favorite, uh, open conspiracy that I brought up last time, the world economic forum and Carl Schwab, the German or Austrian at the top of it or whatever. He said Kissinger was his biggest inspiration and what got him to geopolitics. And I was listening to more about that this week and that dude, I tell you. You you do not have to dig very hard to find these very powerful people in very powerful places saying these very outlandish things. Like, I'm, I'm going to quote him, and it was one of the videos I saw earlier. Uh, he, he's have Carl, Carl Schwab. Is it Carl Schwab or Klaus Schwab? I mean, one of the... Carl Schwab, I think, is the investment firm. That's what, yeah, Klaus Schwab. Sorry, people, I'm... I get names mixed up. Uh, but now it's Klaus Schwab sitting there in an interview. And they're like, oh, man, like, you know, you're an uh, aide or a consultant for all these giant different governments or corporations. Like, how do you do it? And he says, well, due to our young leaders initiative or like their young, something young philanthropist something or other organization that he heads. And I'm going to quote him. We have penetrated most of the world's cabinets. And, and, uh, and I'm going to end the official quote there. And it, or he's like cabinets or rulemaking bodies. And I'm, I'm not sure on that last part, but it's something along those lines. It's like, man, saying, you know, not the wordage wasn't like, oh, I, we created such young, successful leaders that they got like elected to these places or they founded a company that bought them influence. It's like, no, they penetrated and got inside government agencies. It's like, ooh, that is spooky CIA talk, good sir. I don't like it. But I digress. So, like, this will be a great thing to enter, uh, introduce into. So, Klaus Schwab, we really need to get into this. He's the head of the World Economic Forum. And what it is is an NGO, a non-government organization, that uh, it, like... It's like the worst mix of government and corporation. Like they work with both and consult both and get both to cooperate with each other to achieve certain goals. And so fail miserably. Yeah. Merce, pop quiz. I'm going to give you a definition. You need to give me the word. What do you call it whenever you have a merger of corporations and state power? Diabolical. Not well, to. Okay, yeah, true. Uh, that's the literal definition of fascism. Oh, but, like, yeah. Mussolini is like, if I had to give fascism, like, a real clean definition, it's the merger of the corporate and state power into one. Mm. To where you don't have to deal with these pesky 
uh, uh, constitutions or like, no, 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 we pick and choose which one we need where. So you're saying this is the one time we can actually use the term fascism correctly. Yes, and that's why, that's, if there's something that pisses me off about the left, it's the hijacking of this very good word. This very good word that means a very specific thing to apply it to everything to where it means nothing. And it's, uh, so Klaus Schwab, it is Klaus Schwab, not Carl Schwab. Like Merce informed me is like some investment firm, which may or may not be related to him. But, uh, if you look up the interviews, they are wild. The, the interviews that he gives to like it, ranging from NBC to the world economic forum, uh, uh, like open discussions, uh, and one of the crazy things, and I did not believe this, and I read it for myself, and I encourage everybody else listening not to Google it, to something else search engine it. Because I don't know, it's one of them things that Google's a little funky on when it comes to results. But they had, I'm not going to be exact on everything. I'm going to talk in generalities, but you can look it up, it's there. They had a guide on how to bring about like uh, a, a great change, like or how if if certain global events were to happen, how different governments and corporations could react to it in unison to better the human race, as he would say it. Uh, and like it goes from like a chemical terrorist attack uh, to to or maybe it's like a nuclear terrorist attack is one of the scenarios they and when i say they plan it out like they plan what the army's going to do what this corporation's going to do how we're going to get oil to different places uh one of them is operation lockstep and operation lockstep and i read through it and it, like it, it it was what would happen if there was a pandemic outbreak and this was like they wrote this back in like 2012 and how they would need to get rid of dissident information that went against the narrative, and how we would all need to unify on a certain message, and how we would all need to carry out the certain reactions to it in lockstep. And as I like, dude, you read that after going through the virus. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty much a playbook for it. And it's, I, you know... The closest I ever got to genuinely believing in, like, a cabal conspiracy theory was, like, when Alex Jones, the old video of him, like, uh, running into that, that, uh, uh, with the big owl, all the powerful people would go out in the grove, uh, when you said Big Al, I was just thinking, like, I just pictured, like, the Tootsie Pop commercial. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's Bohemian Grove! Bohemian Grove, okay. you never heard of Bohemian Grove! How are you, my best friend? Uh, okay, right. I've watched I've watched way too much of this with myself. All right, so Bohemian Grove is a r real thing that started in like the late 1800s. It was a it was started as a fraternity, I believe it was in California, for the uh, actors and theatrical people to get away from their families and do whatever the mostly get drunk and screw off and do whatever they want. Uh, since then it has turned into like most of the presidents have been to Bohemian Grove. It's a real, and it's always been like whispered about like, Oh, that's where all the powerful people go and do like blood sacrifice rituals and that, da, da, da. it that's for the record. I think a lot of that is extremely exaggerated. However, crazy ass Alex Jones, how he first made his bones was he got the old school VHS tape recorders like snuck in to Bohemian Grove and recorded a lot of powerful people there dressed in robes with a giant owl statue burning an effigy to it that had, they claim it was a mannequin dressed as a woman that they were burning as a symbolic gesture to this owl quote. I'm doing a whole lot of quotey fingers here, people, uh, and Alex Jones got it and ran with it. And that's how he first made his bones and first started getting big back in the nineties, uh, with info wars. And now Richard Nixon is on tape going like, so here, here's why I don't believe Alex Jones on like everything. There's this great tape of Nixon where he brings up Bohemian Grove and he goes, uh, 
someone asked him about it, like while he's in the while he's being recorded in like the Oval Office or something. He goes, "Yeah, bunch of weirdos and faggots around Bohemian Grove. I don't want to ever go back." So yeah. it's like, it's, so I wonder if it's like if it's like. Hey, you join. It's like an Epstein Island thing. Like you join. If you're a powerful person, you join. You think maybe Nixon crossed the line, or he wasn't accepted, and that's why he lost the presidency. Dude, it might have been something like that. But you know, Bill Bill Clinton was having a blast. Hey guys, come <laughs> on. <laughs> Let's get. I'll play my sax and get you in the sack. And like I don't know, the uh, an extremely charitable interpretation of Bohemian Grove would be like it's a bunch of dudes or fraternity being really weird. And doing fraternity stuff. A non-generous interpretation of it. But I don't think ultra cynical is something along the lines of like. These are some very powerful people with some very odd beliefs and odd religious beliefs. And then if you want to crank it up into Alex Jones territory. Yeah, they're doing some awful demonic stuff. And there's that, His video is, I don't think it's on YouTube anymore. But you can find it on the internet. Just look up Alex Jones, Bohemian Grove. Uh, but anyways, the reason I bring all that up, even considering Alex Jones sneaking his way in there and getting all that back in the day, even then I was like, you know, I just don't really believe in an ultra conspiracy. But when you start seeing these World Economic Forum videos, and I implore anybody to YouTube them, or it's like it's not like it's not like a hidden recording that someone caught them on a hot mic or so. No, it's like a press conference, and they're telling you what their plan. One of their plans, and I'm going to quote, is for no one to own property, and for everyone to be happy. I did see that. Yeah, that's them. That's that's their thing. And I don't want to be friends with those guys. No, me neither. I like my property. All right, so I was talking about working cattle, and I got to, like, say my conf- – so, so, like, a lot of this podcast is going to be my own conflicting values on, on certain topics. And, like, one of the big ones I see because of my lived life experience growing up with the cow crew I've always worked with is uh is immigration from Latin American countries into the United States, and <laughs> Merce, I I ask you while well, asking you on the fly, he's totally unprepared. If there was a sentiment that most Southern small towners had towards immigrants from Mexico or other Latin American countries, how would it be expressed? They took our jobs. <laughs> yeah, took our jobs or <laughs> build that wall or by God, it's our land. Get the hell off. But I'm like, all right, why'd you sell it to him? Anyways, that's neither here nor there. But not really, but it, it's a good point. But here's, I don't care where you're from. I just don't want you here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even natives, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Uh, no, so like I grew up working with these cowboys, uh, this Mexican cow crew. And it was like five guys, uh, all in their 40s. And like, you got to understand, they grew up around racist white cowboys. And I don't mean that in the SJW, like, oh, they got called, they they said a dirty joke about Mexicans in front of them once. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, you're the Mexican, you're digging the ditch. Why don't we all dig the ditch? Because you're the Mexican. Like, <laughs> so like these guys grew up like underneath I, when I hear people talk about rough working conditions, or I hear about the plight of the Amazon workers, which, like, don't get me wrong, the guys that, like, died in a tornado in an Amazon warehouse, that was messed up. When I hear when I hear that someone was forced to work, like, 10 hours a day, and I'm like, with no break, I'm like, oh, you, you poor soul. Let me tell you about Raul that came down here in the 70s and worked without shoes for two weeks for, like, freaking 12, 14 hours minimum. Uh... So I, I grew up around these guys, and for me, it was such a cool but strange relationship. Because, you know, you get close to the people you work with, but the people I worked with did not speak English. <laughs> and I, I learned to speak a little bit of decent Spanish on the fly. And so, like, let me back up a little bit. So these guys that came here in, like, the 60s and 70s that first started learning a little bit of English, first started getting a foothold on how to work cows or how to do stuff in the groves, they moved up in the ladder, and by the time I came of age, 
at least at our ranch, there's no more white cowboys. They're a thing of the dinosaur. And it was all Mexican Latino cowboys that my, my granddad hired. Well, when I was growing up, we, and, and like, uh, when I was growing up, when we started working cattle, it was with all of them. And now here's the thing. These guys got treated like shit by the white cowboys when they were growing up. So now that they were in charge and there was a white cowboy coming to work under them, it's time to return that karmic justice they've probably been waiting on for so long. And like, did I like them doing it at the time? No. Which, by the way, they probably didn't treat me any worse than they treat like some young other Mexican that came on the crew. I'm gonna like, you know, just giving a rough hard time. Oh, I remember being young. All cowboys are mean to just young. mean as shit. Yeah, dude, I, I'm talking about like uh, w- one time cowboy I worked with, Louis, long ponytail, about five foot two, looks like he was made out of chiseled rock. Like, just like I described it last episode. One of the people you look at, you're like, Jesus, you just hurt. <laughs> just looking at him. Uh, and he said, hey, Lombriz. That was my nickname. And uh, I would tell all the white girls that don't know Spanish that that means wild stallion. Lombriz. Sounds so good. Any Mexican girl was onto my games. It means worm. Because <laughs> I'm tall and skinny like a worm. And yeah, so my name's Lombriz. And Luis comes riding up next to me on his horse. Hey, Lombriz, you have a fast horse. You have the fastest horse out of anybody here. I'm like, yeah, yeah I, I, I like Johnny Mac. He's a good horse. He goes, you should race me right now. You should race me on my horse. My horse is not so, it's not fast. But I, I, I bet you win. I bet you $5 you will win. Oh, like this is right, right when we got done with lunch and taking a nap. I'm like, all right, you're making me feel good. Oh, I'll race you. Well, little did I know that he undid the girth a little bit loose around my saddle. So when I go to haul ass, my saddle goes sideways. I go sideways off the horse and roll. So that's. That's growing up with these guys. So, like, I've I've had times in my life where I love these people like family. Like, if you work with anybody for, like, 20 years, and you, I've had other times of wanting to bash their head in with a rock. But everybody for different reasons on this cow crew. So, like, siblings. Yes. Uh, and the only thing is you don't know what they're saying half the time or what we're supposed to be doing half the time until we're, like, halfway through with it. Uh, but anyways, I grew up with these guys – And I'm naturally inclined to be like, dude, I I could say I grew up with probably around 15, 20 Mexicans I knew personally, knew their names, knew their families, knew their brothers, knew their cousins, stuff like that. Uh, They're all related to each other, hell. And uh, I'd say like most of them I grew up around, dude, would never break the spell. When I I turn on Fox News – and I hear about Mexicans coming over the border, oh, they're rapists, oh, they're da-da-da. Like, don't get me wrong. I agree, there, there is some of that, definitely, or else there wouldn't be anything to report on. But I was like, most of them, in my experience, are terrified to go over the speed limit or not wear a seatbelt or, like, you know, would, would they're going to drink 12 beers in a pasture, but they'll be damned if they're going to drive, you know, when they get, eh, maybe if they're on the farm road. But uh, anyways, like, it, it, really cautious about, like, breaking the law and stuff like that. So, on one hand, and also I, uh, because of my views, I kind of think all government institutions are arbitrary and unnecessary, and that would happen to include borders. Uh, I'm like, in my mind, I'm personally open borders, but I, in the current structure of things, like if you're going to have like a public school system, if you're going to have public forms of public health care, forms of public welfare to like the thing that the, the left says that drives me even crazier than the right calling them. I'm not going to say it drives me crazier. It drives me about as crazy as the right, like grouping them all is acting like this welfare is unlimited. Like, clear, like if, if you want to talk about redistributing wealth, like, like legitimately, they, they always do it to just include the United States. But as soon as you talk about redistributing the wealth, like, globally, like, so if this is true for us, it must be true for everybody. Like, dude, it goes from... It goes from the billionaires being the top 1% to pretty much, like, all Americans are the top 1%. If we're redistributing the Yemen to... to Sri Lanka to friggin' Tibet to all of them. Yeah, we're going down like a bunch of pegs. So you can't have open immigration with the system of of socialism baked into it. Uh, 
So the only thing I know about that situation is it's horribly messy. And the one way to quick fix it is private borders. Like I know the one place I don't want any Mexican or white guy or anybody of any national creed, color, or faith is my property without my knowledge. Like that's my ultimate immigration policy. Like, no, 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 not my property. And if you're Hello. What if you're doing something to affect my property? All right, I can see a counter to like kind of what I just said. What if a giant group of Eastern Europeans, because they're white, I'm not being racist. Let's say a group of gypsies move into your neighborhood and start taking it over. Hey, we're all allowed to be racist to gypsies. <laughs> that's, that's the beautiful thing about them. I've seen the memes. I've, you, you could talk crap about them anywhere in Europe. And they're high society. But let's say you get a bunch of gypsies that move into your neighborhood and start lowering your property value. Is it ethical to take some sort of... Like, all right, let's say, hypothetically, in my Ancapistan head like you know like there is there's only private borders if someone's affecting the value of your property is there a ethical thing to do about it besides Murph's this obvious answer I can see burning in his eyes which is go steal that value back <laughs> we had it burning I was just it was going to involve fire yes yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so have you heard of the ministry of truth no okay first glance if you had to guess what it was I'm going to say the name of the people investigating the child touchers in the Catholic Church. That, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. But no, <laughs> well, all right, let's put a slight askew on it. Let's say you knew one fact about it, okay? Touching children's bad. Besides that fact, <laughs> what, what if I told you it was being established by Joe Biden? Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This isn't fun anymore. <clears throat> no, no. Yeah, Biden is officially uh, establishing, let me pull it up real quick, just so I'm not misquoting, uh, from the Wall Street Journal. Biden establishes a ministry of truth. The disinformation governance board already looks like a partisan instrument. Um, yeah, the the I watched a little bit of a lady that came up uh, to, to who's heading it. And all of the misinformation talking points. Ugh. You know, if you want to talk about misinformation, and this, is, this was a great point that Dave Smith brought up. What's the biggest lie from the public that you can think of that's like done the most damage? Like one lie, and not like from a government source, like I'm excluding that, of like something rampant. Like, the one thing I can think of off the top of my head is, let's say, uh, what was the cult in California that castrated themselves and then killed themselves to get on an alien spaceship? Scientology. No, not I those. Know, I know. Not those guys. <laughs> the other guys. The other ones the that ones equally that fit, that fit that description. No, not Jonestown. That's, that was forced on them. It was uh, Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate. You know who I'm talking about or yes, no? Okay. Yes. About to say, you were really worrying me as my friend. Uh, but, uh, you know, I could say, like, man, that was some, like, misinformation that led to, what, like, over a dozen people or 20 people castrating and killing themselves and all that. Uh, let's say, let's say, if you're looking at it through the most critical of lenses, Waco could have been, oh, they were a cult. That disinformation led them all to... And by the way, I have a totally different opinion on Waco, but we're, we're just talking about the official narrative. You know, all oh, that misinformation led them all to this dangerous cult that led all of them to their death. Like, all right, like, granted, misinformation can cause some pretty bad situations. Until the government makes it worse. Dude, if you look at, so like what, it, now when I pose that same question with government, what's the most dangerous misinformation the government's ever given us? What about, like, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction? Like, oh, how many people did that kill? <laughs> like, whoa, a lot more than, than Heaven's Gate. What about, what about, like, Gulf of Tonkin? Like, that they shot on us. Like, whoa, so many. Like, like it's, so, it's so utterly ridiculous. And something that the conservatives, I, I know I knock on conservatives a lot, 
So, yeah, it's the Hunter Biden laptop. And the, if there's something that conservatives can put a feather in their cap on, it is this one as much as I bash y'all. Because, like, on one hand, my first, like... Because when I hear the sensationalist headlines, like what you brought up about all those plants burning down, my natural inclination is like to go like, oh, how could even the right wing media be, be using this to manipulate my bias, you know? So I try to like check it. And with the Hunter Biden thing, I was like, well, maybe this is just like a, I don't know, a guy's private laptop. I'm sure if you went through any of our stuff, you'd find stuff that doesn't necessarily pertain to our public image. Uh, but oh my God, oh my God, what is in this laptop, dude? It is like everything from, from him getting with his dead brother's wife. And the strip, and who's a former stripper. Who's a former, ah, hey, God bless strippers. They got to make, they're great capitalists in my opinion. Uh, but dead there's so much there's like I can't think of it all off the top of my head but just google search it or bing search it or duck duck go or brave search it it's dude it is stomach churning stuff and the one the one leg conservatives can definitely bank on from the from some of the polls I've seen is that they asked like a lot of people that voted for Biden like if you had known about this before the election would you have still voted for him like they were overwhelmingly like no <laughs> no 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 uh so it outright changed the outcome of an election and as the talking heads would say directly affected the very core of our democracy uh so yeah the fact that these people are going to be in charge they're going to be the arbiters of truth they're going to be the ones calling what's the right information and what's not God, this is, uh, we're, you know what? At least Elon Musk bought Twitter, which may or may not be a good thing. May or may not be a good thing. I don't, I, you know, on, I really wanted this episode. Like I, I'm making some new rules for the bandit podcast and one of them or bandit radio. Hour, and one of them is not to talk about Elon Musk every single episode. <laughs> and we almost made it through this one, but I do got to say this. I was listening to a really neat interview with uh, Tim pool. It, it was a really, he's a good reporter. Don't agree with all of his opinions, but he's a good reporter and good on tech. And they were talking about Neuralink. And don't get me wrong, Elon Musk Neuralink is the one thing I'm like most skeptical of. I'm the most like you ain't putting no microchip in my brain because <laughs> so, uh, let's say he has the most noble of intentions. Hypothetical, someone can still hack it. I'm sure that there's something. I'm I'm sure something can go wrong. We're just one step closer to Terminator. Yeah, yeah, we really are, but. Tim Pool did give a really neat idea about Neuralink that made it sound much more attractive for me personally, especially for someone that thinks the way I do. He said, he's talking to Glenn Beck, who's a conservative. He said, as a conservative, he's kind of playing into everyone's bias when he says this, because as a conservative, you know you're right about everything. He said, so as if you were to have Neuralink, you could interface all of your memories, all of your points of view, all of your experiences with someone on the left, and they would instantly understand your point of view without ever having to debate you, without ever having to use words. Because, like, you know, words, we're, we're, we're taking these big thoughts and we're compressing them into sounds that come out of our mouth. Like, actually, there, there's much more going on in your head than actually comes out. Uh, and Neuralink ideally fixes that it is instantaneous all of like the bandit rate oh god imagine if someone hooked up to my brain oh i, I would be a weapon of mass destruction <laughs> just random heads popping <laughs> it would look like the boys season two just pop 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 oh god that's horrifying <laughs> i'm the secret weapon against elon musk you can't quantify this <laughs> but uh anyways I, I, and you know, and here's the thing about Tim Pool. Why you're saying it like that to Glenn Beck? He would make the exact same pitch to a lefty. Like, oh, you're right about everything. So you could hook up to a conservative, and they actually instantaneously know all of your all your racial prejudices you've experienced, and all you would actually understand where they are coming from. 
And the appeal of that is like huge to me. If you can just like hook in like a video game and get some of that, then just jump off and unplug, get far, far away from it. Like that would be, because that's like one of the things I crave the most is like, how do you come up, if I hear it at first, like, that's a crazy idea. How did you come up with it? And no, I'm wrong. 90% of the time, I'm like, oh, okay, you're a crazy person. Like that 10% that there might not be a crazy person, there's some logic to it, like Hippie Lady from episode one. Awesome. Firing all the receptors. Um, but there, there, yeah, on face value, there's a lot of bad that could happen with that. So... I don't know, but I'll, I'll be honest with you folks. This is an off kilter episode tonight. This was mostly me shooting from the hip, us rolling on the fly. Uh, but I sure as hell hope y'all are enjoying it. And we're going to get back on this next week. And I appreciate y'all listening and, uh, stay tuned to the bandit radio hour. <laughs>